Despite crushing Houston in the Big 12 title game, Iowa State is the lowest number two seed in the NCAA tournament. But did they deserve the fourth one seed over North Carolina? You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Happy March Madness. Welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, the only daily national college hoop show out there. We are your hosts. This is Andy Patton. I'm Isaac Shade, and you're joining us at the place to get your college basketball content every single day. Thanks for making us your first listen or watch. And a special shout out to all you everydayers out there. If you're not part of the Locked On College Basketball Discord community, you're missing out, especially right now. The link is in the show notes. Come join us. It's free. This episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job right now at linkedin.com slash locked on college terms and conditions apply. Andy, it is Holy Week in the world of college basketball. So let's uh, just give everyone kind of an overview of where we're headed this week today. We're going big picture on this thing, the one seed conversation, the bubble, the snubs, some fun superlatives. Tomorrow on Tuesday, we're going to go more in depth on the left side of the bracket, east and west. Wednesday on the other side, the Midwest and south. And then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, man, we're talking yep. games, games, games. We're going to be going live when games end Thursday night, Friday night, all that kind of stuff. So just stick with us all week all March long. And obviously today, also the transfer portal is open, Andy. So there's mm -hmm. so much happening. Let's get right into this one seed conversation. Andy, there were two different conversations in the one seed realm. And so let's have both of those here right out of the gate. Number one, we've known for probably months now mm -hmm. that the top three seeds in some, or the top three teams overall in some order, were going to be I'll name them alphabetically right now, Houston, Purdue, and UConn, although it's alphabetically Connecticut first if you say it that way. <laughs> um, Andy, when things rolled out, the committee chose UConn number one overall, Houston number two overall, Purdue number three overall. The first question for today, did they get it right? I think so. I, I think so. And it, one of the big conversations we have about the committee a lot at this time of year is at what point do they make the decisions that they make? How much do those final games matter? You know, how much did, like, for example, Illinois, Wisconsin, did it move either of those teams all that much on the seed line? My guess is probably not. But no. what about like, you know, a few games before that? And, and you look at this and Houston obviously took that loss to Iowa State, which we're going to talk about, 28 point loss for a, a really good team. Purdue obviously did not win the Big Ten tournament. They lose in overtime to Wisconsin, a team that's uh, struggled a bit, uh, particularly lately. Whereas UConn, they did take care of business. And, and wow. certainly I think that UConn didn't face the same caliber of, of competition uh, in their, in the Big East tournament just because of the way that the bracket shook out. But uh, I think that having UConn be the top team when the other two teams failed to win right. uh, their conference tournament. I mean, to me that I, I don't think it was as cut and dry of just, that's the reason they made the decision, but it's hard to argue against that when that's the way that it shook out this time. Yeah. Because I, I think we even said like at this point last week, before we got to champ week, mm -hmm. they all felt so similar. Like it was insane yeah. how yeah. similar they felt. And this I is the slightest it. difference, but it matters. Exactly. And that's why mm -hmm. I think we even said, it might even come down to who wins their conference tournament and who doesn't, as you just said. Yeah. And UConn was the one that did it. And not only that, but Andy, I've been voting Purdue number one in our Locked On poll for a while, but based on resume, based on eye test, yeah. UConn and Houston are at the top of the heap yeah. for me. Agreed. Agreed. And then, you know, so UConn wins the Big East Championship, um, both regular season and tournament, I might add. Houston while they got blitzed in the big 12 championship game got there and yeah. won the regular season in their first year in a power six conference, unbelievable stuff. And then Purdue just slipped in the semis against Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. They could have won, um, but they didn't. And so I, I've got no problems with this. Okay. Andy though, the second part of the one seed conversation is the fourth one seed. 
this time last week, we thought it was down to North Carolina and to Tennessee, chiefly because Arizona had lost at USC to end the regular season. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as the week wore on, Tennessee lost in the SEC quarterfinals, which was shocking to yeah. me, quite frankly. Um, I, I just thought they were rolling. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, Arizona lost in the semis mm-hmm. of the Pac-12. North Carolina loses to NC State in the ACC championship. And Iowa State was that one team, as we just said, that won the conference. Yeah. It blitzed things. And so the, the the talking point became Saturday night and into Sunday. A lot of bracketologists and, and national college basketball media are saying, oh, now it's Iowa State that's the one mm-hmm. seed, which they'd kind of been an afterthought in that conversation. We had been naming them, but not taking it seriously. Would you agree with that? Yeah, and I so, would. And so, Andy? On the live, on our live bracket reveal show, we said, all right, we think it's going to be Iowa State or North Carolina. Iowa State shows up as the two seed in the first region we saw, the East. And at that point, you and I said, oh, clearly that means it's North Carolina as the one seed. But Andy, why was that a misnomer? Well, because the committee really had it come down to UNC and Tennessee. They actually had Iowa State as the lowest of the of the two or yeah of the two seeds. They had them eighth overall. North oh. Carolina, of course, fourth. They end up getting that final one seed. Tennessee came in at fifth. Arizona sixth. And Marquette was actually in at number seven there. And and uh, it's conversations with the committee chairs. Matt Norlander spoke to him some really good insight into that conversation. They they mentioned that they kind of penciled in Carolina early uh, to, to be that final one seed and uh, picked them over Tennessee. And that was kind of the, the battle. And the main reason being, and I'm I'm happy about this. I'm happy to go on a soapbox about this too. Uh, <laughs> they punished Iowa State for their relative, not relatively, their incredibly weak non-conference strength of schedule. And I like this because I think in the committee chair, I believe the exact way he phrased it was we take the whole season into account. The entirety of the season matters. So who you played in the non-conference matters. North Carolina, they played a very tough non-conference schedule. They 36th at Ken Palm, by the way. 36th. Yeah, that's a lot of really you good. You want to teams. guess where Iowa State was, Andy? I was like 350th or something. Like some 351. There are 362 teams in Division One. I. I think as a Power Six team, that needs to be held against you. That's right. And I, I specify Power Six team because I don't like, uh, and so often, so often, strength of schedule is held against mid-major programs in a way that I think is entirely unfair. Mm-hmm. People will acknowledge, well, this team only played three quad one games. This team only played, uh, you know, they, they went 0-1 in quad one. I saw somebody trashing South Florida who did not get in that large bit and didn't deserve an at large bit. But somebody was like, oh, they didn't even play any quad one games. And it's like, do you think that they chose not to? Yeah. Because teams don't want to play them. That's teams right. like Iowa State will not play teams like South Florida. And to me, punishing South Florida and not punishing Iowa State is wrong. And this is why I'm happy to see. I, I mean, I'm not disrespecting Iowa State. I'm not a hater of them or anything. But they played a really poor non-conference schedule. And at the end of the day, that is what caused them to get the lowest two seed as opposed to getting a one seed. And I, I, I'm completely okay with that. Yeah, it's just, it's shocking because of how everyone went back and forth on this that Marquette stayed above them despite, mm-hmm. you know, Shaka Smart saying that Tyler Kolek should be good to go. Mm-hmm. We just don't know because we haven't seen no. it. Despite Arizona taking some some weird losses, both at yeah. the end of the regular season and in the Pac-12 tournament. Uh, but Arizona played Duke, right? Arizona played Duke. Marquette played Wisconsin. Like, that's right. That's this right. is off the top of my head. Like, Iowa State didn't play those teams. That's right. And so um, just uh, not what a lot of people saw coming. So, Andy, really interesting stuff here at the top of the bracket. But we do have our one and two seeds. Well, Isaac, we had at least four big bid thieves, excuse me, during champ week, meaning that teams that were expecting to go dancing, teams that kind of felt like, hey, we're pretty secure inside the field of 68. They went home. They're done. A lot of teams that we were expecting to see dancing, and we're going to talk about whether we think the committee got that right. But first, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Nissan. This week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out, a team that pushed it further than the rest. Just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs, these guys were able to take it to the next level. And while we were just trashing them a little bit for their non-confidence strength of schedule, this week's team is absolutely the Iowa State Cyclones. They are this week's Nissan Rogue. The team surprised us all with a dominating 28-point victory over Houston in the Big 12 championship game. They locked up the Big 12 
Big 12 Tournament Championship. They say to go win at life, to go rogue, and that's exactly what the Cyclones have done. So take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. This episode is also brought to you by Amazon Fire TV, which is your destination for sports from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV to provide access to millions of movies and TV episodes. I literally, at the Shady Acres is what we call our house. I've got an Amazon Fire TV stick on literally every TV in my household. I love the layout. I love the user experience. I love the handy remote. And it's got these buttons where I can go straight to Hulu or Netflix or whatever it is. Fire TV also recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands all for free. And that includes all of us here at Locked On. So come check that out. Not to mention, they've also got great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, and cooking videos as well. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't done so yet, trust Andy and I on this. To learn more, visit amazon.com slash locked on Fire TV. All right, Andy, since the beginning of February, when we allowed ourselves to on February 1st, we've been talking bubble teams, a phrase that literally uh, on February 1st, we celebrated bubble day and I blew bubbles and it was great. Um, but Andy, for the last month and a half, that's been a massive part of our conversation. And when the, the NCAA tournament field is revealed, then it always becomes a question about who actually did make it in and who actually got left out. So Andy, as we look at, you know, we typically just follow along with Joe Lenardi's uh, bubble watch um, because he's the one that, that most people follow. And so he does last four buys. That's the four teams that make the last four at larges that are in without having to go to Dayton last four in the four teams that do go to Dayton first four out and next four out. So Andy, of Lenardi's last four buys, they all got in. That's Texas A&M, Mississippi State, TCU, and Colorado State, who, by the way, did get shipped off to Dayton. So I guess technically you didn't get that one right now that I say yeah. it that way. Yeah. Um, last four in, three of the four. FAU, who's the opposite side of this. They aren't going to Dayton. And in fact, they're an eight seed, Andy. Mm -hmm. And then Colorado, who... Um, is going to uh, Dayton as yeah. a uh, as a play in, and then Michigan State, which actually got a nine seed, and they don't go to Dayton either. And then Oklahoma, the final of his last four in, is out of the field. Andy, what do you make of those teams? Those eight teams that that were either last four buys or last four in. What's right and what's wrong about what the committee did? Some yeah, some interesting stuff here. I think we see some. I don't want to say disrespect necessarily, but not as high on some of the Mountain West programs as I think the expectation was going to be. Mm -hmm. One of the teams that Lenardi had safely in the field who ended up being in that last four in conversation was Boise State. That's right. Uh, we were pretty surprised to see them in a play in game. I thought they were you know more likely to get an eight seed, a nine seed, and kind of be safely inside that field. Instead, they end up in a play in game. Uh, Colorado State was the last team in which was very surprising to me. We also found out that New Mexico was going to not make it if they didn't win that Mountain West tournament. So uh, again, like we kind of knew that all those Mountain West schools were borderline-ish, like Nevada got a 10 seed, so they made it in, but not super secure. Utah State, eight seed, San Diego State, uh, who finished fifth in the Mountain West, got a five seed way higher than everybody else. Not saying that's unjustified, but it is odd when you look at it that way. Uh, so that, that kind of stood out to me. I wasn't shocked to see FAU get an actual bid, although I think a lot of other people were a little surprised by that same with Michigan State. Uh, for me, the, the biggest surprise out of this though is Virginia. Uh, Virginia was resident. part of the first four out, by the way. Let, let's name those really quick. Yes, Andy. <laughs> those, those first four out mm -hmm. were St. John's, Virginia, Indiana State, mm -hmm. who by who lost to Drake in the Missouri Valley Championship. We need to touch on that as well. And then Seton Hall from the Big East. Go ahead, Andy. Sorry. Yeah, I was just gonna say Virginia getting a, a bid here. I mean, they got a play-in bid. Uh, they're, they're gonna play Colorado. Uh, right, yeah, Colorado yep. so they're put. Yep. 
Yeah, it's so hard it's, with both Colorado and know, Colorado right? yeah. State <laughs> and play-in games. Yeah, but so, yes, the, the play-in games are Boise State, Colorado, mm-hmm. and then Virginia, Colorado State. Yes, that's right. So Virginia, I mean, their net ranking was like 54th when you compare it to like, I, I'm not, I don't know what St. John's is off the top of my head, but I know Indiana I'll State's while you're talking 29th. I know Seton Hall's wasn't great either, so that's fine. But Pitts was 40th. Like, net ranking shouldn't be the only thing that matters. But Virginia, like, they have a lot of really horrendous losses, like big blowout losses. I just... I felt like this team was pretty borderline, and I thought when we saw all the bit these, when we saw NC State and Oregon and and Duquesne and and uh, UAB when they all stole bids, I, I thought for sure that was a death sentence for Tony Bennett uh, yeah. and the Cavs. But instead, they managed to sneak their way in. I think uh, I probably would have had uh, St. John's ahead of them. I might have even had Seton Hall ahead of them, although I think that's close. I probably would have had Oklahoma ahead of them as well. And and I, again, I th- Virginia is borderline. I don't think it's like an egregious yeah. that they're in the field of 68, but there are at least three, maybe four teams that I probably would have picked over them. That's interesting. So looking at the net rankings here, Virginia was 54. Mm-hmm. Other teams that you mentioned, Oklahoma was 46. Mm-hmm. Um, St. John's 32, Villanova 41, Providence 57, Xavier 64, Seton Hall down at 67th. Yeah. So kind of Indiana State, obviously one of the more notable ones at 29. So let's go there next, Andy. Mm -hmm. Indiana State, a team that we all wanted to see in, along with Drake. I really Mm -hmm. wanted both of those Missouri Valley teams in the field. Indiana State, 29th in the net. Drake, 47th in the net. Andy, we talked about this on our live reaction show, Mm -hmm. but Indiana State now becomes the best ranked net at large candidate to not make it in to the NCAA tournament because they lost to Drake. Um, And here's what's unfortunate about it is, you know, we talked about all these bid thieves that happened. We had a bid thief in the A-10, ACC, AAC, and the Pac-12. And ultimately, that probably pushes Indiana State out. Andy, do you think that is correct or should the committee have found a way to keep them in? Indiana State's really tough. I mean, I'm looking at the net rankings right now. I'm looking at every team 12 through 34 and looking at their quad one records. And every one of them has three or more wins. Most of them have five or more quad one wins. Indiana State has one. Yeah. Uh, and it's like if you have very few quad one wins, the rest of your resume has to be nearly perfect. And you talk about that with like Auburn and Alabama who are limited on the quad right. one wins. Uh, even it's, just, Gonzaga, it's an Alabama thing down there, man. They can't yeah, get so, right? <laughs> even Gonzaga picked up two quad one wins at the end of the year, but they had one quad one win going into the final week. But they were still feeling like they were safely in because the rest yeah. of their record was pretty much perfect. That's not the case for Indiana State. They're one in four in quad one games, but they also have a quad two loss. They also have a quad four loss. Yeah. And to me, it's like – that is that's borderline and and 29th in the net is great it's great it's the, i mean like you said it's the highest that's ever not made it and i think they absolutely have an argument but i also see the other side i see why you i, I mean even though i'm virginia i'm not super high on i see why you would take them they have more quad one wins they have better just a, a better resume in general even with some of the ugly losses they don't have a quad four loss for example so I, I I get it. I I wish Indiana State had made it from a narrative perspective. I yeah. wish we got to see Robbie Avila in the tournament. Uh, we didn't, and that's unfortunate. Uh, but, but I, I think, think it's the right. I think it's the right call. I think it's the right call. Yeah. I, which I I think you put it beautifully there by saying, from a narrative standpoint, I would have loved to see them. But I, I hate to say it, but the Sycamores should not be in. By the way, though, that next four out that also didn't make it in Pittsburgh from the ACC. I think a lot of people thought they were a really good team with some NBA talent on it. Just haven't done enough. Providence, Kansas State, South Florida are some others. Andy, one of the interesting things, and, and we can be very brief on this because I want to get to our superlative, superlatives. That's going to be a fun conversation. <laughs> but with these bid thieves, because we had, I, I just named those conferences, but in the A-10, it was Duquesne. ACC, it was NC State. AAC, it was UAB. Pac-12, it was Oregon. You would ask earlier on Sunday, and you were spot on with this thought, Andy. You said, um, could the first four games end up being 10 seeds instead of 11 seeds like we usually see? Because mm-hmm. it felt like the bid thieves were all in that 11 or 12 range caliber. And Andy, my man, I want to give you flowers on that because mm-hmm. Duquesne, NC State, and Oregon are all 11s. UAB is a 12. New Mexico, who you talked about earlier, is an 11. And both, Andy, this is how spot on you were. Both mm-hmm. play-in games are for a 10 seed. Virginia versus Colorado State and Boise State, Colorado. Yeah, I, I I think that that's the right call as well. Okay. Not not because I predicted it, but just because like Duquesne and, and UAB, they're not bad teams, but like them play them being higher than a play in eleven 
teams that are just straight up better than them just wouldn't have made a lot of sense. So I think I'm, I'm happy to see uh, Boise State, who I think should have been in the field safely, at least if they win against Colorado, they get a 10 seed. Colorado probably deserves a 10 seed over some of those other 11 seeds as well. So I, I'm glad that that's how it shook out and the committee made the right call right there. Well, Isaac, we're going to talk about UConn because, frankly, they might have drawn the toughest region, which feels just bonkers considering that they were the number one overall seed. We're going to talk about that and who might be this year's Cinderella story. All of that coming up. But first, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, LinkedIn Jobs. Folks, when you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. And that's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs, which has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster, and they do it for free. Thankfully, LinkedIn is not just another job board. They have a vast network of over a billion professionals, making it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals that you cannot find anywhere else. LinkedIn does all that while making the process both easy and intuitive. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. And LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats and they may not have the time or resources to hire. So they're try always trying to find ways to make the process even easier. For example, they just launched a feature to help you write job descriptions. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, Isaac, closing out the show here on Monday, the first day after Selection Sunday, one of our favorite shows of the year as we get ready to get more in-depth on the regions by regions, Tuesday and Wednesday show, and then, of course, getting straight into the madness on Thursday and Friday and throughout the rest of the weekend as well. I want to talk about what we think was the toughest region. And for those of you who listened to our live reaction show, which you haven't done so yet, you can go check it out. It's on YouTube and audio. It's just us reacting live as the bracket is revealed on CBS on Sunday. But one of the things that stood stood out to us was how difficult UConn's region is in the East. And Isaac, I, I you know, we pointed out like four of the six power six conference tournament champions are in the East region. And that feels insane to do that to the program that you ostensibly have as the number one overall seed. Yeah, it's insane. Uh, the, these conference tournament champions, by the way, for those of you watching, you can see we've pulled up that, that East region here on uh, YouTube. Um, yeah, so you've got UConn, and, and not only do you have those four, but they are the top four seeds in this bracket. UConn, the one, Iowa State, the two, Illinois, the three, and Auburn, the four. Obviously, they're the winners of the Big East, Big 12, Big 10, and SEC, respectively. Not to mention, uh, you know, that as you look at the top half of this bracket, you've got Florida Atlantic, FAU, the eighth seed, and you've got San Diego State, the five seed. And Andy? That means that in the top half of this bracket, you've got three quarters of last year's final four. So I, I know that the only the, three that even made the tournament too. Exa exactly. Shout out Miami. The, fourth, the fourth is Miami and they're sitting on South beach, sipping my ties or whatever today. <laughs> um, or maybe hanging out with what life wallet. Was that the, uh, the yes, NIL thing? For that? <laughs> anyway. Um, and so Andy, you know, while, FAU hasn't set the world on fire this year while mm -hmm. San Diego state has had a lot of challenge in the mountain West. Mm -hmm. There's something to be said about that championship pedigree that they both have where FAU brought a lot of those guys back. San Diego state um, has some real dudes. Jaden Ladia is one of the best players in the entire nation. And so Andy, for, from all of that teams, winning conference tournaments, teams with final four experience coaches mm -hmm. with final four experience, the committee has done UConn no favors. And Andy, we well know, because we've talked about it, that no reigning national champion mm -hmm. has made it beyond the Sweet 16 since Florida repeated in 07. And maybe the committee just was trying to keep that trend going, Andy Patton. Yeah, they, they like to put them against matchups where they might have to play teams that were in that final four. We, I think that's a real chance they play FAU in the second round if they can get by Northwestern. I think San Diego State has a very real shot of not only beating UAB as the 12th seed, but potentially upsetting Auburn in the second round. And so if UConn wants to break that streak, get into the Elite Eight, they may have to beat teams that 
were in that final four last year. And then even if they get there, they're probably facing a conference tournament champion, whether it's Iowa State, who, like we said, beat Houston by 28, whether it's Illinois, who won their the Big Ten. Like, this is not going to be an easy path for UConn. I still think they're the best team in the country. I still think they have a real opportunity to be that first team to make that repeat national championship, uh, to, to bring that to stores. But uh, this is not an easy path for them. And, and certainly when you look at some of the other sides of the bracket, like, uh, for example, cough, cough, the South, where I think uh, Houston's got a lot easier path to potentially get themselves all the way into the, the final four and, and the national championship. Uh, things just look a lot easier on that side of the bracket. Well, let's go there, Andy, because from toughest region, we want to talk about the easiest region. And Andy and I believe, and I'm pulling the South region up, that the South region is the easiest. Andy, why so? Well, I think you're looking at some different factors for some of the teams that are in the top four seeds that, that could could be the impact here. So obviously Houston's your one seed. You got Marquette as the two seed. And I don't think Marquette's a, a bad two seed by any stretch, but they may not be fully healthy. And I think that's the big storyline for them is Tyler Kolek. Shaka Smart has indicated that Kolek is going to play in the NCAA tournament, but oblique injuries don't just disappear. And so if you have a, a if your two seed is a Marquette team that doesn't have a 100% healthy Tyler Kolek, I think you feel okay about that. If your three seed is a Kentucky team that has some pretty ugly losses on their resume, has been wildly inconsistent in the season. Uh, John Calipari has struggled with some success in the tournament in the last couple of years. I think Kentucky might be the weakest three seed, and I think you feel pretty good about that. And then you've got Duke. Duke is your four seed. Duke's been struggling. Wisconsin's your five seed. They've been struggling. Like, I, I kind of see why Houston, I mean, I'd be grinning ear to ear if I was the Cougs because I think they got a, a pretty decent draw here. Now, they got some lower major or lower seeded teams that I think could be kind of dangerous. James Madison is a 12 seed. They're, they're pretty good. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Boise State or, or Colorado potentially made a run uh, if they can get by Florida and Marquette. But if you're Houston, I don't think you're as scared of this side of the bracket as UConn might be theirs. Nope, very much so. And obviously there's some guys that can go out, you know, like if they face Texas A&M, Wade Taylor, yeah. dude, if they face Wisconsin, Wisconsin was three and eight down the stretch of the regular season, but made a run in championship. Yeah. You know, so we got some things yeah. that could go. Andy, let's do the most fun first round matchup as we keep going on our superlatives. Uh, we'll name one from the first four and then you and I each have one. I think we're really excited about this Boise State Colorado game. Boise State as you said a little bit ago, we think is one of the more underseeded teams in the tournament. Obviously, Colorado has some insane talent on their team. I love KJ Simpson as a guard. Um, Cody Williams is going to be one of the highest drafted freshmen in the nation, and I'm not even talking about everyone there on Colorado. But Andy, outside of the first four, what do you have as your most fun first round matchup? Well, our first four is a pair of West Coast teams, so I'll have my my overall favorite matchup be a pair of West Coast teams as well. It's a 5-12 between St. Mary's, the Gales, uh, Randy Bennett's team, the five seed in Spokane. Fun that they got a draw to play out in Spokane, taking on the 12 seeded Grand Canyon Lopes, uh, the WAC champion. Uh, Grand Canyon played Gonzaga last year. Now they get a chance to play St. Mary's this year. They're a team that wants to be in the WCC really good way to prove you, you belong in that conference is to take down one of the top dogs. Uh, Grand Canyon is a really good team. Uh, I think they have a real potential to be a potential uh, Cinderella type team in this tournament. St. Mary's very, very good, played really well in their last game against Gonzaga. But uh, I think Grand Canyon could make this one really interesting and it's a fun battle. Uh, I don't usually love mid-major teams getting matched up uh, against each other, but a 5-12, it kind of just has to be the case. Yep. There's not going to be a lot of power six teams on the 12 line. So I'm okay with this one because I think it's a fun regional game. Uh, and I think it's it's going to be a really exciting ba battle between two good teams. I'm going to go with Kansas, the four seed, and Samford, not Stanford. One is in the tournament, the other's not, in the Midwest region. This reason being, Samford is one of the top five leading offensive teams in the country in terms of points scored. They also play a very unique style of basketball called Buckyball, named after their head coach, Bucky McMillan, where they're pressing you literally all game long against Kansas, a team that we're still not sure how Kevin McCuller and Hunter Dickinson are going to fare. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, a team that is already not deep facing a team that runs and presses and does all that can Kansas overcome the Bulldogs going to be a really interesting first round matchup now Andy in in a similar vein we went to the most fun potential matchups in each region I know we're short on time so let me just fly through these and then we'll get to our Cinderella in the west we're talking about North Carolina and Arizona as a potential matchup in the Elite Eight. Why? 
Caleb Love and assistant coach Steve Robinson going back up against the North Carolina Tar Heels. How wild would that be? In the South, we're talking Houston and Kentucky. This is um, a, an Elite Eight potential matchup, and this would be a defense versus offense. What do I mean? Houston is the number one in the nation in fewest points allowed per game at 57. Kentucky number two in points per game scored at 89.4. Andy, there's a big chasm in between those two things. In the East, the, the most fun potential matchup we're looking at, UConn versus San Diego State in the Sweet 16. Why is that? National Championship rematch. Enough said. Midwest, Purdue, and Tennessee. That would be an Elite Eight matchup, and we like that one as a fun potential because it features the two of probably the three National Player of the Year front runners in Zach Eady from Purdue and Dalton Connect from Tennessee. Andy. We said sleepers and Cinderella's. Why don't you give us your kind of Cinderella pick? Well, I kind of already teased it, so I'm going to just go straight into it. It's Grand Canyon. It's Grand Canyon. Bryce Drew's team. I, I think Bryce Drew's done a phenomenal job since taking over this job for the Lopes. Uh, I think Vanderbilt might be having a little bit of uh, remorse uh, in terms of letting Bryce Drew go and hiring Jerry Stackhouse. Now, of course, Stackhouse had some success before getting let go, but Bryce Drew has done a phenomenal job with this Grand Canyon program. Uh, they're a 12 seed. They got St. Mary's in the first round. If they get by that, they got either Alabama or Charleston. I would not be surprised at all to see Grand Canyon in the Sweet 16 potentially lining up against those Tar Heels of North Carolina. Uh, main reason, tie in Grant Foster. This dude is an absolute mm -hmm. star. 20 points per game, six boards, uh, about two assists, about two blocks, about or two steals, excuse me, about one and a half blocks per game. Started out of junior college, played one season at Kansas, played one year at DePaul, although he was hurt. Uh, he actually suffered a serious heart issue and missed multiple years. Returns to the floor. Now he's averaging 20 per game for a really good Grand Canyon team. I really like this team. I think they're a fun kind of Cinderella darling type storyline. Uh, and if they can pick up a couple wins early, I think there's a real chance that they'll be all over the news as this year's Cinderella. I'm going to go with the Drake Bulldogs out of the Missouri Valley. I know we were talking about wishing we had Indiana State, but we do have Drake and Tucker DeVries, who is the nation's sixth leading scorer, Andy Patton, at 21.8 points per game. If you don't know his name, go ahead and learn it right now. Drake is a 10 seed taking on the seventh seed Washington State in round one. I know Washington State has a good defense. I believe they're 26th at yeah. Ken Palm defensive efficiency. And so could be able to hold him down. But man, there's just something, Andy, we talk about it all the time where people just go off in the tournament. If he could do that, then it would be the nation's sixth leading scorer against Ken Palm's number one team in defensive efficiency in Iowa State. What a fun thing that would be. I would just love to see Drake get on a little bit of a run and do it. Well, folks, as we said earlier, we're going to get more into the nitty gritty of each region throughout the rest of the week. And so make sure you come join us tomorrow on Tuesday as we go through the left side of the bracket. And then on Wednesday as we go through the right side of the bracket. And then on into the week as we actually get to games on Thursday, it's going to be so great. If you're not part of the Locked On College Basketball Discord community, come join us. The link's in the show notes. It's free to join. If you're not subscribed to our show, do so now so that you don't miss a second. Hit that little bell icon so you know when we go live at the end of the day of games, and it'll just give you a notification you can tap on in. Andy, as always, apologies to the lawyer family. Let's go Wildcats, and until tomorrow, peace.